see how we go. So we went through an example yesterday looking at the capture. So we went through, without going through too much about SSL, we went through the capture to show uh, some of the exchanges. It was just one example exchange. Let's recap on how SSL works. With SSL, we establish or we agree upon some parameters, the algorithms to use for encryption, for example, and the keys to use. That's part of the handshake at the start. So there's this specific protocol for handshake. We'll see the, the exchange shortly. We can change algorithms midway through. So there's a, a protocol, essentially just once short message we send if we want to tell the other side let's change to the next set of algorithms. So for key exchange we can use RSA and then when we want to encrypt our data we can use another algorithm like triple des. By sending a change spec message we change the cipher or the set of ciphers we use. Alert is for the case if something goes wrong we tell the other side something didn't encrypt correctly. And the record protocol does the encryption. So let's look at that. So some of these handshake messages are encrypted using the record protocol, not all. And normally our data is encrypted once we set up the session. This is how the record protocol works. When we have a piece of data from the application, for example, my web browser needs to send a GET request to the server. That's the application data. The general approach for the record protocol is to break that into fragments because if the application data is too large, there's a maximum size of the fragment so that we can do efficient uh, encryption and delivery. So it's possible to break the data into fragments. It doesn't have to be. Uh, depends upon the size of the data. For each fragment that we have, we may optionally compress it. That's not for security, that's for performance. It's an option to okay, apply some compression algorithm to make the data smaller. So we save network bandwidth. Then we add a MAC, add an authentication code to the end. So we saw yesterday in our example when we specify the ciphers, we specified a hash algorithm. I think we saw examples of SHA and MD5. They are hash algorithms. But we actually use a MAC here. How do we convert SHA into a MAC? Uh, and the general approach is called HMAC. That is, SHA and MD5 are hash algorithms. We actually use a MAC algorithm here which takes the data and a key as input to convert a hash algorithm into a MAC algorithm, we use what's called HMAC. There's, and you remember, HMAC uses what? It's related to your iPad. It does some paddings, and it uh, uses the hash algorithm combined with a key to produce a MAC. So that's for authentication. Uh, you take a MAC of the compressed data, that is, you take that as the input, and you get some authentication code as the output. Then we encrypt all of that. The compressed data plus the MAC is encrypted using our cipher that we've chosen. Add some header to indicate what fragment this is uh, and some other parameters for that this is an SSL record header. Send that fragment across the internet. That's the basics of the record protocol. That describes some of those details there. We use HMAC for the MAC. Fragment has a maximum size of 16,000 bytes. Compression is optional. Uh, that's the main point so that covered in that previous diagram. Uh, that's another view of that same output packet that is the header, four fields in the header. The plain text, which may have been compressed, the MAC that was calculated from the plain text, all of that is encrypted. So both the MAC and the plain text are encrypted. 
That's what we send when we were sending our encrypted data using SSL. We're not going to go through these. These are the structures of those other packets that's, which were sent. We saw in the Wireshark capture some of those packets. We don't care about the exact structure in this course, just the, the intended purpose of those, some of those messages. And that's better explained in the next few slides. So when we set up a TCP connection, SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, then we do an SSL handshake. Allow the client and server to authenticate each other and negotiate some parameters to use. There are different parameters that you can choose from. So SSL doesn't force you to use a particular algorithm. You can choose. And that's what we saw yesterday. The four basic phases are determine what the capabilities of each other are, authenticate the server, authenticate the client, and finish the handshake. There are different types of messages. We saw some of them yesterday in the, sh in the uh, Wireshark capture and the list of parameters included in those messages. But let's see them in this exchange. This is what we saw yesterday. Or this is a more general form of what we saw yesterday of those exchange of packets. Yesterday we saw when the client creates a TCP connection, it sends a hello to the server saying, these are the set of parameters that I support, the algorithms that I would like to use in the hello message. The server sends back a hello saying, let's use this set of algorithms. So it selects one of the ones that was offered by the client. So they establish capabilities and they ag agree upon or they select a, an ID for this session and some other parameters, some random numbers and so on. Then we, the second phase is that we want to authenticate the server. That is, the client wants to make sure that the server it's communicating with is who they say they are. If my client is the web browser and I'm accessing the web server of my bank, I want to make sure that it is the web server of my bank, not someone pretending to be my bank's web server, and therefore receiving my password and stealing my bank password. So phase two here is server authentication. How do we authenticate servers? How do we authenticate servers? What do, we, what do we talk a lot about yesterday for authentication? To send a public key, we send it in a... Anyone? If I... To authenticate, we can send a certificate. How do we authenticate this server? Certificate, because the server sends its certificate. Inside that certificate is the public key of the server and the identity of that server. It's signed by some trusted authority. If the client trusts that authority and they receive the server certificate, then they know it's been signed by a trusted authority. They know that this is the certificate of this person listed in the identity. And it should be the... Uh, name of the uh, server that we expecting to connect to. And we can confirm, uh, or we can verify that certificate by using the authority's public key to decrypt. If, if it was some other server pretending to be my bank web, web server and it sent me a certificate then I should be able to check whether it, whose certificate it is. Because that other fake server cannot get the certificate of the, uh, the banks. We cannot forge the certificate of the bank's public ID. So we get the public key of the server, and we'll see in a later response we can confirm that's the correct public key. 
uh, yesterday. Some of these messages are optional. Um, what did we see yesterday? The, the server can optionally request a certificate from the client. It didn't do that yesterday. In our case, when we use HTTPS, we received the certificate from the server and then used the public key to encrypt. But the client did not send a certificate to the server. That is, there's no certificate request yesterday nor a certificate sent because uh, we're only authenticating the server using a certificate. We're not authenticating the client using a certificate. When you log into your bank website, you want to make sure you're communicating with the bank. How does the bank make sure that you are the right person to access that account? How do you do that? A password and a username. That is, you are authenticated, the client is authenticated by the bank, not using a certificate normally, but using a username and password sometime later, not as part of this exchange. So you don't have to have a certificate in both directions. It's typical that the server sends a certificate to the client, but not back. There's some message to say that we're done, server is done. Um, the client key exchange is a message that is sent uh, from the client to the server. That contains a what's called a pre-master key. We know a pre-master key, before the master key. We know that we need a master key between both sides. And then later we'll use that to generate session keys. How it actually works when we use RSA is that the client chooses some value, some secret value that will be used to generate the master key. It's called the pre-master key. So the client tells the server, here's the pre-master key. The server, both the server and the client use that secret value to generate a real master key. They have an algorithm to specify how to generate that. We're not going to go through the algorithm for the key generation. It's, it's deterministic. If you want to look, you can look in the lecture notes, uh, sorry, in the textbook or on, on some website. But there's an algorithm to generate the master key. Similar, there's an algorithm to generate a key for the Mac. Remember, we perform, going back, we calculate a Mac on the plain text. The input of a Mac is the plain text and a key. It's not the master key. It's not a session key. It's another key that we use for a Mac. So we, in fact, have a pre-master key that is used to generate a master key. That master key is used to generate a session key and a Mac key. So we have many keys. And the algorithms for generating those keys are defined. That is, everyone knows the algorithms, but they don't know the original input. Uh, the last steps, because we do the initial key exchange, or the key exchange and certificate exchange using RSA, in our example, there's this last change cipher spec to say, let's now start using our data cipher, the cipher that we use to encrypt data. For example, triple DES, AES, or whatever is chosen. And they both do that, and then they send a finished message. After this phase four, they can send data, encrypted using the cipher that they've chosen and the keys that they've generated. So that's, that's a quick summary of that handshake protocol. We won't go through any more detail. We saw an example of it yesterday. You don't have to remember all these steps. You will look in last year's exam and you'll see, I think in last year's exam, I gave you some data from a Wireshark capture and ask you some questions like, okay, here's the capture. What algorithm was used for the Mac? Or what algorithm was used for uh, encrypting the data? And you should be able to see from the capture which algorithm was selected. And the answer to that would be to look at the hello messages. The client sends the server its set of algorithms it wants, or it can possibly use. 
the server chooses one of them, those algorithms are used in, in the remaining steps. So that's all we want to say about SSL. It can be used for different applications. The common one we see it is for secure web browsing, which is HTTPS. All HTTPS is, is the normal HTTP on top of SSL or TLS. So HTTPS is just using SSL. And you know that the URL uses HTTPS instead of HTTP. A web server by default listens on port 443 when we're using HTTPS, a secure web server. A, D, a normal web server listens on port 80. So that's just some implementation differences. And when you use HTTPS, the URL of the requested document, the contents of the document when it comes back, the contents of browser forms, cookies, the content of the HTTP header is all encrypted. So a malicious user that intercepts the packets between your web browser and the web server cannot see any of that information. So that's the security it provides. In practice, the server is authenticated using a certificate and the user or the client is authenticated using a password, which is not part of SSL, it's part of HTTP. Or part of the application. Enough on H HTTPS and SSL, let's go through a different example, Secure Shell. You all use Secure Shell, you've used it to remotely log into another computer. As if you're sitting at that other computer, you log into that computer. In the old days, the way to log into another computer was a program called Telnet, or a protocol called Telnet. It does the same as SSH, except it's got no encryption. It's insecure. So if I wanted to log into the IT server using Telnet, I would use Telnet, the IT IP address or domain name. And then when the, I type in commands on my computer, they execute it on the remote computer. Everything that I execute and is sent back is not encrypted with Telnet, including your password when you log in. So it's very insecure because if someone intercepts the packets, they will see your password and they see everything you send and receive from the other computer. Hence the development of SSH. SSH can be used for things other than just remote login, like file transfer and tunneling. There are different parts of SSH. The authentication protocol, or the user authentication protocol, to authenticate the client. The server wants to make sure that the client that's accessing it is allowed to access, is who they are, uh, who they say they are. Uh, the connection protocol is allow you to send um, multiple connections via the one TCP connection. Do things like tunneling. And the transport layer is the thing that does the uh, encryption of data, server authentication, and does uh, MACs and so on to provide data integrity. Uh, so, yes, your, uh, your remote login application makes use of these three layers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not directly, not, in, not necessarily, in, uh, possibly in the session uh, layer of OSI. <coughs> Maybe not presentation. This transport layer maps into the transport layer. It's not as simple anymore that there are five layers. In fact, here we have TCP as part of the transport layer. 
and the SSH, SSH transport layer protocol, also part conceptually of the transport layer. Let's have a look at a capture, I think, to see how it works. We'll look at the Wireshark capture of an SSH session and illustrate some of these steps. This was a capture of my client connecting to the IT server. So I was using SSH from home and I connected to the IT server. So I could run commands remotely on the IT server. Similar to what you did for your homework. You logged into the IT server to upload your files and to run commands. The first few things are ARP and uh, DNS, finding the domain name. Uh, the first thing of interest to us, in this case there are in fact multiple Synax, it didn't initially work, it took some time. Uh, but we see a Syn, Synac and ACK. That is, we establish a TCP connection. After that, we see some SSH messages. I'm going to filter and just show those SSH messages. Concentrate on them. Filter using SSH. So, what I've done is, on my client computer, I don't know if it was IT or I think it was ICT. So what I did at my client computer is typed in on the command line SSH ICT and that initiate a connection, a TCP connection from client to server and then SSH goes to work, the protocol starts. And these are the steps of the protocol. We see the source of, two, or the address of 203.131.209.82 is in fact the server. And 192.168.1.5 is the client. So the connection is established using TCP and then in this case the server sends a message to the client. Let's look at that message in a, a little bit more depth. It's sent from the server. SSH server uses port 22, sending to our client using some random port on my client computer. And this message, what does it contain? A short string from the server to the client you can, anyone can come closer, that's okay. Short string from the server to the client saying what version of SSH is being used, version 2.0, the version of the software being used, open SSH, and something about the implementation. That is, it's open SSH running on Ubuntu uh, operating system. Just something to, to identify the software that the server supports. The response from the client, the next packet, is similar. It's the software supported by the client. So they just tell each other, this is the version I support, because if they support incompatible versions, they will not proceed. That is, maybe the client has an old version and it's no longer trusted, the server may choose not to proceed any further. In this case, they proceed. So just some initial exchange of the identify the versions. And then the client sends this key init message, key exchange init. 
to initialize the key exchange. And I can see you're getting excited, excited because the next packets are Diffie-Hellman. And, and you can remember how Diffie-Hellman works. I expand this key init message. It's the client saying to the server, these are the algorithms I support. Similar to what we saw in SSL. The client tells the server, I want to use these algorithms. I support these algorithms. Here, the client's saying to the server, these are the algorithms I support. And let's look at the different things that it advertises that it supports. So, in, in the packet itself, there will be some number that identifies an algorithm. Wireshark has mapped that number to a name. Yep. Let's record what have we got. There's some key exchange algorithms. KEX is the abbreviation. We need to exchange a key between client and server. So what algorithm are we going to use to exchange a key? The client suggests it will use Diffie-Hellman group exchange using SHA-256 or Diffie-Hellman group exchange using SHA-1 or a set of others. The client says what algorithms it supports for key exchange in order of preference. Uh, what were they? Um, we don't have a KDC in this case. This is from client to server. Uh, to use a decentralized, you'd need to have a pre-shared pre master key, so no. Uh, it's decentralized, but in that specific algorithm we looked at, we required a, a pre-shared key, a master key. Here we assume we don't have a key beforehand. There is no key exchange in this case. So we need an algorithm to choose a key and exchange it. And we know of one, it's Diffie-Hellman. Two nodes want to exchange a secret. They haven't exchanged anything secret in the past. They use Diffie-Hellman to choose a secret. And that's what we see in this case. What else do we have here? Encryption algorithms, MAC algorithms, compression algorithms. That is, the client is saying what algorithms it supports for those different operations, which are going to be needed later. We see the MAC algorithms, HMAC with MD5 or HMAC with SHA-1 or some other algorithms. Compression, none. Uh, encryption AES 128 128 bit key with counter mode CTR or some other ones. So that's the client advertising its support for different algorithms. Server host key. Uh, and another one. The server host key algorithm. We see either RSA or DSS. So this is our public key algorithm. We see in the subsequent messages where they are used. Is there anything else? That's the main information in this key exchange in it from the client. Server response. It says the same thing. It lists the algorithms that, they, that it prefers to use. And the highest matching algorithm is used by the uh, client and server. 
So they both tell each other what algorithms they support and the algorithm that is common for each of those and the highest in the list is chosen. So they agree upon those algorithms. First two messages tell each other about the version. Next two messages tell each other about the algorithms you support. The fifth message, Diffie-Hellman. So now, because of those algorithms, the key exchange chosen was one of the Diffie-Hellman variants. They use Diffie-Hellman to exchange a key, a secret value. Let's see how it works. If you go to your slides, uh, one of these slides lists the, that's the Diffie-Hellman key exchange for, for a reminder that the way that we approached it. In terms of how SSH names some of those parameters, it's listed here. That is, this is a notation used by SSH. We, we called it Q, Alpha, Y, A, and Y, B. SSH calls them P, G, E, and F. Let's see them in the exchange. P, G, E, and F. The first message is sent by the client to the server saying that we want to start a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It indicates the maximum value, I think, of G, the minimum and maximum. And then in the next message that the server responds with, it chooses P and G. G, 0, 5, and P, this long number here, some long random number. G is, DH base, which is in our uh, Diffie-Hellman alpha. Remember alpha and Q? And P is Q. The number I'm not going to write down at 0, 0, C, A, this long one here. If you remember from Diffie-Hellman, there's two public values, alpha and Q. Q is the modulus, alpha is the base. These are the values that have been chosen for those public values by the server in this case. Sorry? For the G, is the hexadecimal or just integer? By default, it should be hexadecimal. Let's look in the uh, packet. Uh, let's check. Hexadecimal, which is the same as integer, the uh, same as decimal. So this is the start of the Diffie-Hellman. Recall, I'll just go back to the slides. You've got it in front of you. Recall from Diffie-Hellman, there are two public values, alpha and q. Alpha is the base, Q is the modulus. Both sides need to agree upon alpha and Q. Everyone can know that. One side chooses a random XA, calculates YA, sends YA to B. B does the same, but with XB, calculates YB, sends back YB. From that, they can both calculate K, the shared secret. That's Diffie-Hellman. The key K is calculated. It's not chosen. This message from the server, the server simply chose Q and alpha. The notation is P and G. 
So the client knows these two values, as does any malicious user, because it's sent in the clear. Let's see the next one. The client, the client calculates its value YA. That is, it chooses some secret value XA, uses alpha and Q to calculate YA, and YA is sent to the server. It's called E in SSH. So this is the value of YA. It's just different notation based on our lectures, Q alpha and YA, and based on what Wireshark reports, P, G, and E, where this is just this long number, 6, C, 3, 2, a large number there, this one. The next message comes from the server. It contains YB. F. Which is this long value zero zero C six so on. The server chose the public values, told the client, client calculated client chose XA, calculated YA told the server, the server chose XB, calculated YB, and in this message tells the client. Since they both have either side's public value, YA and YB, they can calculate K. Do you see K there? I hope not, because that would be insecure. K needs to be the secret value. They don't send it unencrypted. They generated it either side. So they use the Diffie-Hellman equation to calculate the value of K. And they'll both know the same value of K. In fact, it's a little bit more complex. In so that's the Diffie-Hellman. Uh, the server also signs this value and in <coughs> calculates a MAC on this value. Yes, it's so, yes, that's right. Yeah, it's signing the K value here. Uh, no, uh, not signing the K values. I think it's sign, it actually signs a combination of F, the the, the Y value, and then other data as well. It uses TCP. But when it lies in the protocol, which one should be lying in this column? Uh, this it may be transport, maybe application, maybe network. That's what Wireshark reports. It reports the highest protocol known to it. So if we filter with TCP, it's included in TCP or not? Uh, no, I don't think it will. No. So we have to specific. If yep. we know specific. Yeah, you need a different filter if you want to search for TCP as well. If you cannot see the details of these, these two, this one and the previous capture are on the website. You can download and look at the details in your own time. I'm just trying to illustrate that this is Diffie-Hellman in work. They choose a secret. using Diffie-Hellman. And they choose a secret and then they, the server has a key pair. So a public-private key. The public key of the server and the private key of the server. And 
assuming the client trusts the public key of the server, we can use that to do the signature. Yeah. Yeah. If I accept the server, will send me the is public key. Yeah, I think you you may have noticed when you first access some server with Secure Shell, you first log in, it may present a warning to you, saying you're trying to access a server. Do you really trust it? <coughs> What's happening is that you're receiving a public key of a server, but the client is not sure whether to trust it. It's asking you, the user, do you trust this server? And if, if you do, then it will proceed. If not, it will not let you connect. So you need to trust the server or you need some other way to get the public key of the server. Let's finish on our capture. We exchange a secret. The new keys message says, let's use a new generator key. So there's again an algorithm to use that secret to generate a master key. And from that master key, generate session keys. From there, because we now have a secret between both sides, no one else knows that secret, we can encrypt data. And we cannot see the contents of the rest of the packets. There's ciphertext and a map but I cannot see what the plain text is because I do not know the key. It was generated using this Diffie-Hellman exchange, or the, the initial key was. And the session key will determine that after you log out or the time out? I think the session key for every SSH connection is generated, but it, it may, during a connection, create a new one if it's part of the policy. I don't think we'll go through any more detail of how SSH in the example works. The main point here is that we negotiate algorithms. We tell each other, the client and the server tell each other what algorithms they support for key exchange, for encryption, for MAC, for compression. They choose the algorithms. They exchange a secret. In this case, they use Diffie-Hellman to exchange a secret. After that, they can encrypt. And we cannot see any more information from there. We just see encrypted packets. Now, everything that you type in on your terminal at your client and is executed on the server, all the commands and all the responses are encrypted. As a malicious user, we cannot see what's typed in. We cannot see the username and password typed in. So that's the security of SSH in this case. In one of these packets, one of these encrypted packets would be the password that I typed in at the client and sent to the server to log in. Let's go back and see what we've missed. So in SSH, the server has a public and private key pair, say an RSA public and private key. We assume the client knows the server's public key and trusts the public key. Therefore, if the server sends us something encrypted with the private key, we know it came from the server because we can decrypt with the corresponding public key. So that's the authentication of the server. The server, if it sends, sends us something encrypted with its private key, then it must have come from the server, from the client's perspective. So long as the client trusts the server's public key. And during the key exchange, the server signs messages with its public key, which is slightly different from what we've seen in other cases. Uh, and the client, two ways to authenticate the client. The typical way is uh, using, well, password-based. That is, to make sure that it's the right client, the right user who has access to this server, 
the user has to enter in their password, username and password. But of course, all that's encrypted. Another approach is that the client has a key stored on it and can send that to the server, and the server can authenticate. So you, you don't need a password to log into a remote machine. You need a key. Uh, Password-based authentication requires the user to uh, uh, gives the possibility of a brute force attack on that password. Our ICT and IT server, for you to log in, you need to supply your password. There's 50, 40 students. I guarantee amongst some of you, you've got weak passwords. Okay? If I give you the chance to choose a password, some of them will be weak. I hope not too weak. What that means is someone, a malicious user out on the internet, can try, once they discover your username, which is very easy, they can try a brute force attack on our server, try and log in on your account by guessing your password. That's a problem. A way to avoid that is to not allow password-based log in, logins. For you to log in, you have a public and private key pair stored on your computer, and you give me the public key, I trust you, you trust me, I put that public key on the server, and when you log in, you sign a message with your private key, and I can verify that with your public key. And I know it's you because it's signed with your private key. Yeah, so you can encrypt something with the private key and I can verify it with the public key. Well, the server can verify. Yeah. So therefore, there's no need for you to enter in a password to, to be sent to the server. And therefore, no chance for someone to try and guess your password. The problem with that approach is that you need to generate a key pair and give me the public key. Make sure I trust it. That takes some setup. It's server authenticated with a public key cryptography client, either public key cryptography or password based. We've got a choice there. The server doesn't enter a password. You assure it's the server based on public key cryptography. Yeah. Password or key. Two different approaches. If you have your own key pair and you've given the server your public key, then you don't have to enter in a password. You just do SSH ICT and it will automatically log in. It will use your private key to send a signed message to authenticate you. That summarizes the key exchange steps or general key exchange. We just saw a specific case with Wireshark. Uh, similar with SSL, you generate or you, you find a secret using Diffie-Hellman, find a secret value of K, then you generate master keys based upon that secret. And this is just the way to generate a key. So with Diffie-Hellman, we find the value of K, and with some of the values which were exchanged, which may be public, a session ID, uh, the identity of the client, and some value of H, we use them to generate a session key for encryption. H is the hash of some long value, which includes the identity of the client, server, and some public values. But the point there is, agree upon a secret, K, generate a key that you'll use for encryption, K, C to S in this example. And encryption from client to server, use a different key from server to client as well.
that just lists this set of algorithms that are supported, I think, by default, uh, and the defaults. Diffie-Hellman we saw, and we saw the example of the key exchange with Diffie-Hellman in Wireshark. And I think that's all. We won't talk about tunnels. You can use SSH to create tunnels between a client and server, but we're not going to cover that. So you don't have to remember the details of how those protocols work, but if you're presented with some of the details in an exam, try to be able to interpret what some of that means within the context of what you know about different ciphers, about hash and MAC algorithms, about key exchange with Diffie-Hellman and similar. We're not going to cover tunnels. It, any questions on transport layer? Which one? The four slides that I just skipped over, yeah, not, not covered. It just gives some extra details. We don't need to go into that detail. Not in the exam. Yeah. The last topic. How to intercept which message? Mm -hmm. Hang on. Yep. Okay. Ha the question is, how do, I, how do you intercept a message? Because uh, if you want to make an attempt at discovering what some, someone's communicated, you need to intercept the message. Uh, depends upon the network. For example, before we start on malicious software, Here's someone's laptop, tablet, or phone. They're using the SIT wireless LAN. There's a, and the way that the wireless LAN works is that your laptop communicates wirelessly to an access point. There's one out in the corridor. And that access point then has a cable So in a simple example, your laptop in this room connects to an access point out in the corridor. That access point has a cable going through the, the walls and the, down to a switch in the third floor. And that switch connects to a router. That router connects SIT, this campus, to the rest of the world through an internet service provider. Very simple view of a, an example network. Question is, how do you capture? How do you intercept packets? Well, you can intercept at different locations. Let's wide say or wide or wireless. We want to intercept something from between the laptop and some server out on the internet, whatever they are. So anywhere along the path, you have the possibility or potential to intercept. Let's look at some of the places. Starting from the, the server end, not on the internet, if we can get access to this router, okay, how do you get access to the router? Maybe you break into the third floor room and you plug your laptop into the router there and direct all the traffic from that router to your computer. If you've got physical access to that router, all of the packets sent by the laptop out on the internet go through the router. It's very easy to capture them. You've seen in a lab that 
PC, router, PC, you can run Wireshark on the router, it captures everything sent through the router. So, yeah, that's a, a very simple case that packets are going through this device. If you can get physical access to that device, or even better, remote login access to that device, but unlikely, you could intercept packets. Similar, if you could get physical access to the switch, you can usually configure a switch to capture packets or, or similar there. Or here's an Ethernet cable. Find that Ethernet cable, cut it in half, and plug the two endpoints with some extra cabling into your laptop. So what it would look like, any of these cables, like is that you cut that cable and plug well, or insert your device, your laptop, your device computer that's going to capture in there. So again, everything between the access point and the switch actually goes through your computer. So you can intercept any packet. So either in any of the devices along the path or in any of the links along the path. Devices are normally easier to get access to. Cutting an ethernet cable is easy and it's easy to patch it together to go through your computer. Cutting an optical fiber is easy, but joining it together is very hard. So intercepting on optical fiber is very difficult. In theory possible, but much harder. But you just need to find one point between the laptop and the server to intercept. Easiest one, the wireless. The way wireless works, wireless LAN, when your laptop transmits, it doesn't transmit in that direction, it transmits in all directions. If the access point's out there, when you transmit your packet to the access point, the access point will receive that wireless transmission. So will a computer here, as will all the other computers within range of the transmitter. So it's an omnidirectional antenna, it transmits in all directions, usually around Therefore, a malicious user just needs to be within range to receive that transmission. And assuming there's no encryption on any of those transmissions, then they can intercept and, and see the contents. Hence, it makes sense to use encryption to make sure that, because it's very easy to do this, to make sure that your data stays protected, it should be encrypted. Is your data encrypted? when you access from your tablet or your phone on SIT's LAN? SIT's wireless LAN does not use encryption. WSIT, you don't have a key or a password to enter in. It's unencrypted. So everything that you send, I'm capturing right now. And when you send to Facebook or to all those websites, I capture your password and username very easily. So. If you don't have encryption on the link, say on the wireless LAN, what option do you have? Then to avoid me, even though I can capture, to encrypt, then access the web server via HTTPS. Make sure you don't access the HTTP web server, especially when you log into sites, but the HTTPS version, because that encrypts. Some web servers do not support HTTPS, so you have no choice. Regist registration has, but the certificate is invalid. <laughs> so don't trust it. Uh, how, do, how do you ca capture the wireless transmission? 
Yeah, you even it's very simple on most uh, well on most computers. You just tell your wireless card to do not transmit and receive like normal. Just put it into a mode called monitor mode, which listens to all transmissions from everyone and just receives. Normally, of course it receives the physical transmission, but it recognizes it's to someone else and it drops it normally. You tell the laptop to go into mode, whatever you receive, take a copy. Send to Wireshark and you can see it. Then the question is, okay, if you can capture, can you perform a modification attack? The problem is that the access point receives it as well. So in that case, modifying is difficult because you need to somehow make sure that the access, or make the access point think that what it received before is wrong, perhaps. Uh, you can, you can uh, inject packets in there. That is, this malicious node pretends to be the laptop that's possible. Just start sending packets uh, pretending to be the laptop, maybe with a, a fake MAC address. Uh, but injecting, pa uh, modifying packets before they get to the access point is not possible in that case. Yeah. No, Wireshark, in fact, is just a, a graphical user interface of, of those, those packet capture software like TCP dump, which are to record packets sent across the network, to analyze packets. It can be used for security purposes, but mainly used for network analysis. It can be used uh, as many things can be used in a malicious manner <laughs> if they're unintended. Uh, let's see what we have. Let's see if this is successful and I get my laptop to capture some packets on the wireless LAN. Has anyone, yeah, there's many people who've got access to the wireless LAN, good. Uh, don't do anything bad. GSM is different. The, the, the reason my laptop can capture is because it's got the wireless LAN interface. It can receive anything on the wireless LAN. GSM uses a different, uh, wireless is a different wireless technology to capture on GSM, a mobile phone, then you need a device that supports that. But the problem with GSM is that it has inbuilt security, authentication and encryption. So you need to both capture and uh, decrypt which is a challenge. But on wireless LAN, if it's not encrypted, I should be able to capture. Uh, I have to remember, WLAN 0 is my wireless LAN interface. I just turn it down because I don't want to use it normally. Normally, my wireless LAN, when someone sends a packet the access point sends a packet, or a laptop, another laptop sends a packet. Normally, my wireless transceiver receives that, but sees the destination is someone else, so my laptop just throws it away, it drops it. That's the normal behavior. I don't want to do that. I want to 
monitor everything that's sent. You've used ifconfig to configure an interface. Iwconfig configures the wireless parameters. And my wireless LAN zero interface, I'm not 100% this will work. We'll try. I want to put it into a mode to monitor as opposed to normal transmit and receive. And IWConfig shows the configuration. All right, it's wrapped badly, but it's in a monitor mode on some frequency, which means that everything that other people are transmitting, if my laptop receives it, it will pass it to any application that says so. And now I just turn the interface back up using IFConfig. So anything that's sent now should be received by my laptop. And now we'll capture. <laughs> we'll use TCP dump. <laughs> and we'll s make sure we capture the entire packet using the size and dash. dash Yeah, typically the, the maximum size of the wireless is the same as Ethernet. And save in a file, wireless.capture. Now, is anyone sending? <laughs> let's, let's do it differently. First, I will not save in a file. Print on the screen. All right, you may not make sen sense of it, but every line is when it captures some uh, other one transmitting. Anyone transmitting? <laughs> but these may not be from uh, individual laptops or devices. They may be from just the access, access point advertising itself. In fact, there's not much here. It should be much faster. There was an ARP request there, something from the DHCP server. These beacons are not so useful. Who has a device connected to the wireless LAN? <laughs> uh, just ax open, uh, connect to WSIT and visit the ICT webpage. Try. Otherwise, maybe it's not capturing. Accessed. Yes. Yes. ARP requests. Yeah. The problem if it's on the wrong or a different frequency. Uh, it may not capture. ARP requests are being broadcast by someone looking for another address or for another device. Uh, how many people have accessed? One, two, three. I don't think it's working because I would, you should see more packets there uh, because it, it's on the wrong frequency. Let's make one more attempt. Forty seven packets captured in that case. Uh, see if we can change the frequency. Try one more time. Does anyone know what channel the wireless LAN access point's on? Does it say? There, there are several. That's the, channel 7.
Let's try. <laughs> there were more packets then, at least. But not many, not many client packets. But still capturing packets sent by others, but I think they are mostly sent by servers, for example, ARP, DHCP, uh, and routers. Depends upon trying the the right channel that the access point that everyone else is using. But that's the basics of how you can capture. All right, you can save it in a file, but then look at the packets. Uh, but everything that's being sent on that channel that is received. Uh, that's within range of my laptop should receive it. If, if, this is in, if these packets are encrypted, you will see something here, but when you open it in Wireshark, you will not be able to see the data. The header, you will see that it's a packet, but you will not be able to see the data that is in there. Yeah. The header is usually uh, sent in the clear. Yes, yes. One last attempt. This does a similar thing, but does not capture all the packets. It just records who's around. So this software is listing the access points and also we can see a list of clients uh, that, m again, that my computer can capture packets from. Uh, so different, different channels there, so many different access points or uh, mobile devices that it picks up. Um, and you can see uh, on a bigger screen we'd be able to see more statistics. So we can see the channel of the different devices, the name of the device, uh, and you can actually zoom in on some of the details. For example, the, the signal strength of the, some of the packets received. And down the bottom you'll see uh, addresses and so on. But this doesn't, doesn't record the packets, it just <laughs> catches them. There you go. So on channel... Channel, channel zero. So if I captured on channel zero, I should be able to receive anything sent from there. Okay, one more attempt. Channel one. I think there's a problem that doesn't change channels correctly on my laptop. That may be a problem, but we'll see. Still nothing. that looks like packets, pecky pocky.
these are packets from the device advertising itself. Okay. Next week we will finish on malicious software. That is a very basic introduction to a virus and uh, a little bit about denial of service attacks. And that will finish. I, I don't think anyone here would be, doesn't want to be malicious. So no, you will not. You could, but you will not. <laughs>